Well, as uh, Richard mentioned earlier, I have the uh, privilege of being the youth pastor here and I'm interning, which means that I uh, am learning things in school and then I get to practically apply those things that I'm learning in school here at the church. Uh, but something that I learned this morning, which would have been very useful that I did not learn in school, is how to wear a headset microphone. And uh, although I tried to use it, I, it turns out that I'm not gifted in that area. So maybe I'll work on it for next time, but uh, today I'm using the lapel mic. Well, uh, a couple of years ago, um, before I left to start my schooling at Heritage uh, Baptist College and Seminary, I was living at home and I worked a full-time job as a, uh, at a library. I was working with their, their tech department and I spent the majority of my spare time volunteering at different youth groups. And the one youth group that I spent a lot of time at was called Gentle Shepherd Community Church. And uh, at this church, there was a youth pastor who really spent a lot of time investing into my life, not only as, as a man, but also specifically in ministry and how to be a better leader. And uh, in line with this, he had a vision to start different youth groups and different children's programs in areas that there wasn't already children's programs happening. And he had this desire to start an after-school children's program at a local elementary school, and he asked me if I would be interested in writing the program. Now, at the time, I was really not sure if I was gifted for children's ministry. Um, but I felt either way, if I was gifted or not, I would still be able to learn a lot from it and I, I should apply. And after I applied, sure enough, it turns out that I, I got the position. Well, let me tell you that if I wasn't sure of my lack of gifting before applying for the job, about a week in, it became very apparent to me that I was not gifted for children's ministry. However, it's, uh, it takes a very gifted person to, to serve in children's ministry, and uh, I just didn't have it. It was, it was something beyond me. Same with having the headset microphone. This is gifting I didn't have yet. However, there were things that I learned from it, and I did grow as a leader from it. Um, but the two big things that I want to capitalize that I learned was, uh, first of all, that kids have a very short attention span. Now, it seems shocking, but it is true. It is quite short. Trying to keep, teach kids about the Bible is a very delicate process, and if it goes over about three and a half minutes, you need to have a hands-on illustration or else you are going to completely lose them. And if you completely lose them, they will find something very exciting to do. And that was the second thing I found out, that if you do not give kids something to do, they will very easily find something of their own to do. So whether it was yelling or running around the room or eating crumbs off the floor or uh, uh, you know, dancing, whatever it may be, there was one that always intrigued me the most. And there was one little boy, and his favorite thing to do was hit other people. And, you know, it was, it was almost like I could see it coming, because he would hit someone, and then after you get hit, then there's crying, and I'm in the middle of the story, and then you stop and you, you talk to him. So Billy, the guy who would always hit Jimmy, he would hit him, and then I would stop the lesson, and I would go over to him, and I would say, Billy, don't hit Jimmy, please. Don't do that anymore. And he would always give me one of two answers. The one answer was always, well, he started it, which I'm pretty sure he didn't. And the second answer, which always intrigued me, was why. Why should I stop hitting him? And it may seem like a very cliche answer, and I'm quite sure that this five-year-old knew that, but the reason it, it, it resonated in my mind, and I thought about it quite a bit. And it seemed to me that by him saying, why should I not hit him, he is sort of implying, well, if I'm not to hit him, then how am I to act towards him? And this is a question that may seem very basic, but it's actually at the very core of who we are. The question of how are we to treat others and how are we to act towards others. It may be a coworker, it may be a family member, it may be a spouse, it may be a friend, it may be a brother, a sister, or a teammate, but the question stays the same, how are we to treat them? So, in an attempt to answer this question, let's uh, open up our Bibles to uh, 
starting in the Old Testament. So we'll start in the Old Testament and see how this code of conduct sort of uh, progresses. And the first um, real moral conduct that is given is to the Israelites through the prophet of Moses. And we can find this in Exodus 21, verses 23 through to 25. So here it states, uh, But if there is a serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burned, wound for wound, and bruise for bruise. Now, this command was given to the Israelites, like I said, through Moses, but God gave it to Moses, and then Moses gave it to the Israelites, and it seemingly is put in place to prevent... Um, retaliation from going too far. So naturally, if someone were to hurt me, say someone comes up and pushes me, naturally I don't want re to retaliate in the same way. I don't want to go back and push him. Instead, I want to go back and clock his lights out because he made me mad. So I want to retaliate even more so. And so this act of retaliation is very natural to us. If someone does something bad to us, we want to do something worse to them. And without a law, I'm quite sure that this is what the Israelites would have been used to do. However, God was not content with this way of living. Instead, God commanded the Israelites to live at a higher standard. And therefore, this command of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth is really saying, whatever someone else does to you, you do that equal thing back to them, but do not do it worse. Do the same thing. And so we can summarize this Old Testament teaching as do unto others as they do unto you, but very importantly, do not do worse to them than they have done to you. However, this way of thinking, this way of living, did not last forever. The law, which is the first five books of the Old Testament, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, were supposedly written by Moses somewhere around 1,500 years before Christ. And therefore, the commandment of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth would have been adhered to at around that same time period. But somewhere around the year 600 years before Christ and 50 years after the birth of Christ, this view of do unto others as they do unto you seems to be changing. Now, as you may or may not know, the books of the Old Testament were written somewhere between the years 1,500 years before Christ and 400 years before Christ. And then the New Testament books started to be written around 60 years after the birth of Christ. And consequently, this leaves a time period about 450 years that our Bibles do not account for. However, this does not mean that there was no Jewish literature that was written during this time period. So, in a Catholic Bible, if you go to a Catholic church, in their Bibles, they have a collection of books which are between the Old Testament and New Testament, and it is called the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha is made up of books written between the years of 400 BC and 50, year, uh, 50 AD, and therefore, therefore make up this missing time period that we have in our Bibles. So it must be understood that this Apocrypha is not to be used as an authoritative piece of writing. It's not in our uh, Protestant um, canon. We don't see it as scripture in the same way as the other books. But it does cover a lot of history, and it tells us a lot about what the people were thinking during this time period. Two of the books which are of extreme importance to this development of how we are to treat others um, are first Tobit and then the second book is Sirach. So in the book of Tobit, uh, chapter 4, verse 16, it states, Do to no one what you yourself would dislike. And then in Sirach 31, verse 15, it says, Recognize that your neighbor feels as you do, and keep in mind your own dislikes. Now interestingly, this was the Jewish way of thinking. But not only was it the Jewish way of thinking, but it was also apparent in other worldviews of the time as well. So in a Buddhist um, writing, which is called Udinvaga 518, it states, hurt no others in the way that you yourselves would find hurtful. And in fact, the, this principle is, is shown in so many different worldviews that I couldn't give you a sketch of all of them just because we don't have a time for it. But all of them are communicating the same 
principle. And that principle is, do not do unto others as you would not want them to do unto you. And so there's a switch that's happened over about this thousand year time period. So before it was do unto others as they do unto you, and now it's been changed to don't do unto others as you would not want them to do unto you. So before, um, they were starting to limit retaliation, but now the idea is that they're going to stop anything from happening in the first place. If I was walking in the marketplace and I saw someone had money in their purse and you know, I went, man, I could really easily steal that purse right now, I would think to myself, would I want someone to steal from me? And since the answer would most likely be no, I would then conclude that I should not steal that money either. Or if I was in an argument with someone and I really just wanted to hit the person, I would think to myself, would I want to be hit if I were in their situation? And once again, the answer would most likely be no. And since I would not want to be hit, therefore I should not hit this person either. But however, this view once again changed. And this time, it was further de developed to its final place, and this was taught by Jesus himself. In the Sermon on the Mount, found in Matthew chapters 5 through to 7, Jesus gives teachings concerning the true meaning of the Old Testament and corrects the legalistic teaching of the Pharisees of the time. It is within the Sermon on the Mount, found in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, that Jesus gives the final commandment, which is later to become known as the Golden Rule. And it is here that Jesus states, Do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. And this here is the last and final advancement of what God's original intentment was by giving his command. So Jesus came in, he takes this very well-known um, thinking, this well-known teaching of don't do, everyone knew it, not only the Jewish people, but everyone in the culture would have known it at that time, and he flips it. So before, it was on the defensive, before it was saying, don't do something, and then he took it and he made it into an offensive command. So in the case of the disciples, before, they would be thinking, okay, I should not steal from someone. And Jesus goes, yeah, that's good, don't steal. But even more so, not only should you not steal, but you should also give to other people. And if they were uh, going around, they would say, okay, I shouldn't hurt people. And Jesus is saying, yes, you shouldn't hurt people, but go even further than that. You should also serve people. And so this answers our original question of how are we to treat others? And the answer of how we are to treat others is we are to treat others in the way that we ourselves would want to be treated. So that concludes, no. <laughs> There's a problem, right? What's the problem is we don't, we don't do that. Sure, we may know that we are supposed to treat others as we ourselves would want to be treated, but the matter of fact is, is that we don't fulfill this commandment. We fall short of this commandment time after time after time. And, and that's a problem. And so why? Why do we fall short of this commandment? So, to, to try to find an answer to this, let's go back to Matthew 7 and, and take a deeper look into the passage as a whole. Firstly, as I mentioned earlier, uh, by Jesus stating that this is the law and the prophets, he's showing the disciples that he is not abolishing nor disregarding the teaching of the Old Testament. Rather, what he is saying is that this teaching of the Old Testament, do unto the others, is actually at the very core of what the Old Testament was trying to teach. It is the very essence of what the Old Testament is all about. The people of the time, the Pharisees, were taking the commandments of the Old Testament and were trying to just do the very bare minimum to try and fulfill it. But Jesus wanted more than that. Jesus wanted his people, his disciples, to live at a higher standard. And that's why Jesus told his disciples to do unto others as they would want to be treated. And this was really the correct understanding of what God was teaching in the Old Testament. 
Another part of verse 12, which is of extreme importance, is the beginning. Um, in the study of hermeneutics, which is uh, considered the art of interpretation, the art of interpreting a text, there is a, a nifty little phrase, and it's really important for whenever you come, apart, uh, come across conjunctions in the Bible. And the phrase is this, If there is a therefore, find out what it is there for. Now, I'm sure many of you have heard of this phrase before, but it is very, very important that if you come across a conjunction while you are reading your Bibles, that it is pointing back to something else. So Matthew 7:12, it starts with a so, and a so is a conjunction. So Jesus wouldn't just start his sentence saying, well, so then. He, he's talking about something else. He's referring back to something that's previously been spoken. So because of that, let's go back to verses 9 through to 12 in chapter 7. And here it states, Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or, if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the Law and the Prophets. Now at first glance, it may seem like these verses have nothing to do with each other. But in fact, if, if we look deeply enough, we can see that there's a very close tie. Jesus uses this conjunction of so to point us back to a contrast between us and God. So firstly, we can see that this passage answers our question of why we cannot do unto others as we would have them do unto us. And that is, as Jesus puts very bluntly in verse 11, that we are evil. We are evil people. We are sinful. We are fallen. We are depraved. We are born in a state that is completely against God. In Romans 8, 7, it says that the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. There's nothing in us that can actually fulfill what God has commanded us to do. We naturally hate His law, and we naturally do not want to do unto others as, they would, as we would want them to do unto us. Actually, we want really nothing to do with others. We are so focused on ourselves and our own selfish gain. But thankfully, solely by God's grace, God demonstrated His love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. While we were yet living contrary to God's law, disobeying His commandment to do unto others, and living purely for our own selfish gain, Christ came, lived the perfect life that we could never live, and then died the death that we should have died. And that is the good news in this passage. Which of you, if your son asked for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asked for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? If we disgusting, sinful, fallen human beings know how to be good to those who don't deserve it, how much more will our Father in Heaven give good gifts to those who ask, even if they are not deserving? We are deserving of stones, and yet God gives us bread. We are deserving of snakes, and yet God gives us fish. We are deserving of eternal damnation in hell, and yet God sent His Son to die on the cross so that we may have eternal life through Him. God loved us so much that His Son died for us, that He paid the penalty that we could never have paid. This, this verse, this passage is pointing us to the fact that even though we are fallen, even though we are unworthy, even though we are undeserving, God still sent His Son. And He loves us so much that He would die for us. And because we can have salvation through Him, and because we can ask for eternal life through Him, and because only through Jesus are we granted this, and because we are so thankful to God for what He has done for us, because of that, because of what God has done for us, 
because of what Jesus has already accomplished, because of that, we are to treat others as we ourselves would want to be treated. This passage fits in very closely with another passage in Matthew, in chapter 22, verses 34 to 40. And uh, the worship team sang lots of really great songs that fit in really closely with this. So it says, Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert of the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your minds. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the laws, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And here we can see how Jesus has ordered the commandments. He says, God first and others second. And this displays something very important to us. And namely that is that if we want to love others fully, we need to first love God in order to fill his commandment to love others as he has called us to. However, there is a missing piece to all this that we have left out so far. And, and that is concerning oneself. Our relationship can be portrayed by this horizontal line with ourselves on one end and others at the, end, uh, at the other end. Through this horizontal perspective, everything that we see is marred by sin. We cannot objectively look at ourselves, nor can we objectively look at other people, because our own perception is so screwed up at this horizontal level. Instead, we need a vertical perspective. And it is here that, that God comes in. And we can see our relationships not only with others through God, but in order to have a proper understanding of ourselves, we also need to go to God. An example of this can be seen with the famous man named Martin Luther. Luther played a very important role in the reformation of the church in the 1500s, and many of his teachings and writings are still in use today. However, although he, was uh, although he is known as this great leader and preacher of teaching being saved by grace through faith, that was not always his understanding. In fact, he was very heavily immersed in the Catholic, Roman Catholic teachings and dogmas of the time. And he was under the impression that his salvation was something that he had to work for. It was something that he had to earn. And because of that, he worked tirelessly. He tried to do whatever he could to eliminate sin from his life and to earn the love of God. But he could never fully achieve it. He grew very depressed. He became anxious. He felt as though he would never be accepted by God. But it was upon his reading of Scripture in the book of Romans that Luther came to this understanding that his salvation was not dependent on himself. It was not dependent on his own works. But rather that he was saved through the Son, Jesus Christ, and that his salvation was given to him solely by grace, through faith, and not by anything that he could do. He realized that no matter how many times he would fall short, no matter how many times he would sin, no matter how many times he wouldn't obey the commandments, that he could still go back to God and that God would forgive him. Because he was loved by God, not by how well he obeyed him, not by how good of a person he was, but purely because he had faith in the Son, Jesus Christ. And it was because of this new understanding of the gospel that Luther was changed. He was completely changed on the inside, and he was changed on the outside. And not only did he have a new understanding of himself, not only did he realize that he was cherished by God, but he also could take that love and he applied it to others who were around him. And he has made a significant impact on the history of the church in the last several centuries. Luther first needed to understand God's love for himself before he could live it and show it to others. And comparatively, I believe that this is also the same for us. 
We need to first have a real and true understanding of God's love for us before we can love others fully and truly in accordance to the way that God intended. And so then, based on all that we have gone through today, here are two points that I uh, want you to take home and you can apply into your lives in the upcoming week. And the first is this. Put God first in, your all, in all your relationships, both with yourselves and with others. Look to guidance for, uh, to God. Look for His strength. Reassure yourself of the love that God not only has for you, but for His entire creation. Just as Luther needed to first understand what uh, God did for him and the fact that it wasn't based on his own doing, we need to have that same understanding. We need to understand that we are loved by God because he loves us, not because we love him. And if we put God first in our relationships, we will look to him first. We will look to his work for us. We will look to his work to others as well. And we won't get caught up in all the uh, things of our own life. And the second application is to look to view relationships from the vertical perspective. And this means trying to view others in the way that God views others. Understand that everyone is a sinner, fallen short of God's glory, but that God loves that person and sent his son to die for him or her. Try not to blur your understanding of yourself or of someone else by solely looking at the horizontal perspective, but instead try to view things objectively from God's perspective and think of yourself as God views you and think of others as God views you. And, as you do, it will be easier to fulfill the commandment of doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. And as you will be thinking of that person and yourself in the light of the gospel and the work that God has already completed for us through His Son, Jesus Christ.